Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to CSIS. My name is Peter DeShazo. I'm the director of the Americas program here, and I'm delighted uh, to welcome you all to, um, to our military strategy forum. This is a series of uh, presentations with senior officials of the Department of Defense um, that uh, Today we are delighted and very honored to have with us General Douglas M. Fraser, the commander of the U.S. Southern Command, who will be talking about non-traditional challenges from the perspective of, uh, of U.S. Southcom. Uh, General Fraser comes to Southcom from the U.S. Pacific Command, where he served as a deputy commander from 2008 to 2009. Uh, he commanded operational units across the U.S. Air Force, including the 12th Fri Fighter Squadron at Kadena Base, Japan, the 366th Operations Group at Mountain Home Air Force Base, Idaho, and the 3rd Wing at Elmendorf Air Force Base, Alaska. Uh, General Fraser has also been Director of Air and Space Operations for Air Force Space Command from 2003 to 2005. The General is a graduate of the U.S. Air Force Academy with a Bachelor of Science degree in Political Science and also has a Master's degree in Political Science from Auburn University. He's attended other, um, other schools of the U.S. Armed Forces, including the National War College. Um, we're, CSAS is grateful uh, for the sponsorship of this important series by Rolls-Royce North America. Um, we're looking forward today to um, a very, uh, very important presentation by General Fraser, who will then uh, answer questions uh, from the audience. This uh, discussion with General Fraser will then be followed by a panel discussion with three uh, leading experts on the region whom uh, you have the bio data of, and I'll introduce them when we get to that uh, portion of the event. So uh, again, it's a great pleasure, great honor to introduce General Douglas M. Fraser. General. Well, it's a great pleasure for me to be with you uh, here today. And from that introduction, you're going to wonder, how did I get selected to be the commander of the United States Southern Command uh, with all that time spent in other locations? And, and the connection is I spent uh, high school three years in Columbia. Uh, and so it was a very formative time for me. I graduated from Colegio Nueva Granada uh, in a long time ago. Uh, and so I've had a lifelong affinity uh, for Latin America, uh, for the people of Latin America. And so that, that is my connection. It was, and for me, I would argue it is a dream come true that I've had the opportunity to come back and serve uh, in Latin America with Latin Americans uh, because uh, I had such a, a rich uh, undertaking at that time. And, and to further um, solidify that from my perspective, I had not had an opportunity to, to visit some of my classmates because we scattered to the corners of the earth uh, since, I, since before getting this job. And I've now had the chance to visit with them three different times. And it's like we never left high school. So there is, and I bring that up because there is a close connection, a close affinity that I feel and that I feel with uh, my classmates. And so whether that had anything to do with my selection here or not, uh, I don't know because the secretary didn't tell me uh, what that was. Uh, but that's, that's my connection to the region. And I, uh, I guess I'm going to run this from... Is there somebody, do I need to do this? <laughs> I'm a military officer, I gotta have PowerPoint. Okay, now I'm armed. What I wanna to talk to you about today is a couple of different things. Uh, one is uh, just my perspective on the region. And you have a lot of experts uh, who have studied and been lifelong uh, experts in this area. So, um, and, and I have not. So I bring what I think is a different set of eyes uh, to the region. I'll give you a fairly um, broad overview as I look at it, our mission 
what we're doing from a Southern Command standpoint. I want to focus a couple of minutes at the end on Haiti, but specifically on Haiti on lessons that, that I learned from our experience in supporting relief operations in Haiti and then open it up uh, for questions. You know the region uh, a lot better uh, than I do from our standpoint. I'm responsible for U.S. military operations uh, within this region identified by the red dotted line. That essentially means Central America, South America, and the Caribbean with the exception of Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, uh, the Bahamas. Uh, those are all part of uh, U.S. Northern Command's responsibilities. I put this slide up routinely with all the audiences because there is a great and enduring relationship between the United States uh, and Latin America. And, and I think the things, there's a lot of trade, uh, there's a lot of demographic issues, uh, but from my standpoint, the fact that the United States is the fifth largest Spanish-speaking country in the world, uh, the fact that uh, four of the top ten surnames uh, within the United States are Hispanic, uh, surnames, and that's a growing population. The estimates are by 2050 that one-third of the population of the United States will be of Hispanic uh, descent. Uh, that provides a very unique uh, connection. But I would argue also from a, a U.S. perspective, we a lot of times look east-west and not north-south within our own hemisphere. You know that better than I do, uh, and I've seen that uh, as, as we go through. We still have a robust set of activities there. Our mission and our vision is we're both a joint and an interagency organization. I say joint because I have components of each of the services uh, that work for me, Air Force, Navy, uh, Marine Corps, Army, as well as uh, Special Operations Command. They are stationed and assigned at various parts of the U.S. So they're not all in Miami where our headquarters are, uh, but they report to us. On a routine basis, we do not have a large number of forces assigned to U.S. Southern Command. Uh, right now, we're averaging five to 6,000 people uh, on any given day. The majority of those are in two locations. Uh, first, they're supporting uh, counter drug activities in the maritime environments of the Caribbean and the Eastern Pacific. That's really the detection and monitoring uh, of the, that illicit trafficking. And then they're supporting uh, the, t the detainee operations uh, that we run at uh, JTF Guantanamo. And then the others that are associated with that are conducting various exercises, um, exchanges with our partners, uh, military partners uh, throughout the region. So that's where the complement comes in. An exercise like Haiti, and I'll talk about it more uh, as I get to it, and that is we request forces uh, to support those activities, those crisis activities from the Joint Staff, uh, from Joint Forces Command, if that's a requirement. We're also an interagency organization. We have 17 different organizations from the United States government who are resident within our headquarters. That includes intelligence organizations, the Drug Enforcement Agency, Homeland Security Investigations, formerly ICE, um, energy, transportation, agriculture, a pretty big mix uh, of capabilities. Our civilian deputy, and we have a civilian deputy, is a former ambassador, a long-term uh, Department of State uh, employee, and so uh, there's a real connection there, and there's a lot of support out of the Department of State for various uh, places within our organization. So a lot of interagency support because everywhere we go, throughout the region, uh, that's, a, that's a requirement that we understand what one another are doing. Focused on uh, security, stability, and prosperity, uh, but we also see that we need to have the ability to, to uh, be able to con conduct a full spectrum of military operations. Uh, and so, uh, much like Haiti, I was not expecting to have to respond to an earthquake in Haiti. And so uh, the reason I talk about this is I don't know what the next crisis is going to be, and so we need to remain prepared. That's uh, my job. And so that's why you see the, the full spectrum, but I'll focus more on that on the whole of government approach, and I'll talk about that more in a minute. The pictures you see here are various activities uh, that we conduct on a routine basis throughout the region, from providing some medical care. It's training for our folks. It provides medical assistance. Uh, to uh, 
countries where uh, medical care is not as, a, as available. Uh, we have an experimental uh, unmanned un or remotely piloted vehicle that we're looking to see how we can integrate that in with our counter drug activities there, what uh, the capacities and what that brings. Uh, you see the training uh, with the Marines in the Dominican Republic, uh, as well as uh, with the Dominican uh, helicopters. You see um, practice for intercepting a go-fast boat uh, with uh, Coast Guard and, and some of the vessels that we provide uh, and support the nations in the region with, and then exchanges with Air Force. This happens to be Peruvian Air Force with US F-16s flying uh, in Utah. I talked about partnerships. This gives you an idea of all the organizations that are represented within uh, U.S. Southern Command, and it also gives you an idea of the countries that also uh, provide liaison officers uh, because it's important that we keep those connections uh, with our partners and, and our understanding. So we have a robust number of organizations to help support us. We also have a lot of educational institutions from the Western Her Hemisphere Institute for Security Cooperation to our Center uh, for Hemispheric Defense, Inter-American Defense College, and the Inter-American Air Force Academy, you can read those. So a lot of organizations that help support uh, and build expertise, build partnership. We also look to attend similar types of venues uh, throughout uh, the region. Challenging conditions, you know this uh, better than, than I. Poverty remains a significant issue. Uh, throughout the region, unequal uh, wealth distribution. The top 10% has 48% uh, of the wealth. The bottom 10%, 1.6% of the wealth. And there's a very big difficulty trying to move back and forth between social uh, classes. So uh, that provides uh, also a ground for corruption. This is uh, the Transparency International Index uh, for transparency. The higher number is the better number. Uh, in this uh, equation as far as uh, transparency of organizations and, and governments. And so um, it, it's, it's a mixed uh, situation as you go throughout uh, the region. I bring these up because on the next chart I'll talk about the, my primary concern uh, within the region and that's illicit trafficking. Um, and I talk about that not because it's a military concern but it's a whole of government concern and it, and it undermines the security and stability in the region and that then becomes a concern uh, for me. All these factors though enable some of that illicit trafficking to foster and, and, and be conducted throughout the region. This is the list of the items that I focus on. I do not see a conventional military threat to the United States from Latin America the Caribbean. I don't see Beyond that, a conventional military concern or threat country to country uh, within the region. And so we continue to engage with our partners because there are other aspects that we need to be able to support natural disasters. Haiti is a perfect example of that. But we have also responded to other uh, situations within the region over the last year. Uh, right after the Haiti earthquake was the uh, Chilean earthquake. So we helped support the government of Chile, Chile with some capacity to support that relief effort, as well as rains from uh, Tropical Storm Agatha in Guatemala here uh, recently also provided some capacity to support them. So we never know when natural disasters are going to strike, and so the ability of us to work jointly, combined, on a, a fairly rapid basis is important because it makes a difference for all our citizens. Illicit trafficking then becomes my biggest concern. And by illicit trafficking, I mean drugs, human trafficking, weapons trafficking, uh, bulk cash. Uh, there's even a big uh, market uh, in exotic um, animals, $82 billion uh, a year. So there is a lot of different types of illicit trafficking uh, that happens, and it undermines the security and stability throughout the region. Uh, Colombia has been a prime example of that for a number of years. There has been a great effort uh, to support uh, the reduction of illicit trafficking uh, and the impact within Colombia. It's been successful. Uh, it's not over yet. There's still a fight that continues there. Mexico, on the other end, if you go to the isthmus, is, is addressing that issue now, but the traffickers are moving in between 
also. And so the issue is becoming much more of a concern throughout. The connection with illicit trafficking and narco-terrorism is there uh, primarily with the FARC as well as Sendero Luminoso in Peru uh, because they're being financed uh, through illicit trafficking issues. And so that, that remains an issue that we work. Crime and urban gangs are becoming more and more of a problem, especially in Central America. Uh, there's about 100,000, at least by our estimates, uh, gang members uh, within uh, especially the northern part of uh, Central America that, that are undermining again the stability uh, problems there. Transnational terrorism, Hezbollah, Hamas have organizations resident in, in the region. Uh, I don't, s I stay focused on it just because of, um, I'm paid to be skeptical. What we see right now is support, financial support to parent organizations uh, in the Middle East. I don't see any ops, I don't see anything like that. It still remains a, a, a issue and a concern for uh, the supply they are doing, but on a skeptical basis because the amount of illicit trafficking that happens throughout the region, the ability to move people, goods, capability across the border of the United States makes it a concern that, that I will continue to, to monitor. The potential for mass migration remains. We didn't see any of that as a result of the earthquake in Haiti. It remains as a concern as you look uh, to the southern borders and, uh, with the United States, and so it's an area that we continue to focus on along with Department of Homeland Security, and I talked about natural disasters. Next. I'll do that. I focus a lot on this because um, I think it's the concern, it's the concern that I have throughout uh, the region. We have traditionally focused on illicit trafficking, in my mind, on a country by country basis. And we haven't taken a broader look at it. If you take that broader look and you see that the estimates are between the UN and other estimates, 320 to 394 billion dollar a year industry. That's a significant uh, impact. Uh, on all the, the trafficking throughout. And it is not just an issue in the Western Hemisphere, it has expanded beyond that. Uh, demand remains high in the United States. It remains the number one consumer uh, of drugs. This chart focuses primarily on cocaine because that's what we know the most about, but there are other drugs uh, that are transiting also. But it's not only uh, within the United States, there are growing markets within Europe. Spain is now the highest per capita consumer of cocaine, and it's growing in uh, the Middle East as well. If you take a kilo of cocaine out of the northern part of South America, it's about $2,200 to purchase that kilo. Uh, in Colombia, when you get up to the United States, it runs twenty dollars to $40,000 in the United States. You go to Europe, it's in the seventy dollars to $100,000 a kilo. You go to the Middle East, it runs 120 to 150 dollars per kilo. Uh, so, uh, 95 percent of the cocaine is still produced in the northern part of South America. Trends have been declining within Colombia, but they've been increasing uh, in Peru, Bolivia. Peru, as the UN stated this year, is now the number one producer of coca leaf, not necessarily cocaine. And so, there's a distinction. There. It transits then through the maritime environments uh, to the United States. About 60% of the cocaine produced here gets and makes it to the United States. Two means that we see, and again, this is where we have the most information, Intel-derived tracks, some of this radar supported. Air activity, because of the success of Columbia, in seven, eight years ago you would have seen these tracks all emanating out of Columbia. Because of the air bridge denial programs, the success of those programs, the traffickers have migrated to a location where they uh, can operate. So we see most of those oper emanating out of the southern part of Venezuela towards Spaniola uh, and coming ashore in Honduras or Guatemala. If you look at the maritime environment, they continue to adapt. Six years ago, they would come around the Galapagos for Mexico, Guatemala as a primary first destination, and then transit up uh, through Mexico into the United States. What we're finding is go fast remain about 40 percent, almost 50 percent of the trafficking capability in the maritime environment. You've heard about semi-submersibles. 
Uh, we've seen a decline in the use of semi-submersibles, at least of what we know, over the last uh, couple of years. They peaked in uh, 2008 and have been coming down. But you saw evidence the capture in Ecuador of a fully submersible vessel means that the traffickers are continuing to involve. A $4 million vessel built in the jungles of Ecuador is a significant undertaking. Uh, with a vessel that has uh, oxygen scrubbers, has <coughs> two engines, has the ability to operate fully submersible is a significant uh, leap in technology, if you will, can transport uh, 10 tons of cocaine. So a significant capability, that's the first one we've seen. We don't know uh, whether there's others. What we find uh, this year also is, uh, on average to date, we have disrupted or uh, obtained about 100 metric tons of cocaine. That's about half of what we did last year. Uh, and we don't know why. But, but the numbers of, of activities are up. Uh, so there is a change going on within the trafficking world, and we're trying to catch up uh, with that right now. So my message there is it is not just a Western Hemisphere issue. It is also transiting uh, through other parts of South America into West Africa, up into Europe. And we need to look at it as an enterprise and address it as an enterprise from where it's produced, how it's transited, uh, reducing the demand and the, the national drug program within the United States focuses on this as a public health issue and addressing it to reduce the demand within the United States, uh, but the traffickers are going other, other places. And it's significant because uh, the homicide rates in, in Panama, for example, because the traffickers are coming ashore further south on the isthmus, uh, has increased by 80 percent over the last year. Uh, so there is a significant impact that the trafficking is having, especially in, in Central America, but it's also starting to have an impact in other parts of South America. My concern is, and this is not a traditional military concern, our job is the detection and monitoring in the maritime environments. That's, that's what uh, we're to do. We get intel from law enforcement, a lot of that local law enforcement, some of it supported uh, through U.S. Uh, efforts as well, and then we monitor those vessels as they transit the maritime environments until we can hand them off to another law enforcement organization, whether it be national organization uh, or international or U.S., who then intercepts and detains and, and then prosecutes uh, those, those organizations. So if I go back to my earlier side and talk about the importance of partnership, the importance of interagency, it all comes through as we look at this uh, chart. The other thing I'd like to say is this is a non-traditional threat in the way that we think about it. It doesn't respect our borders. It doesn't respect the normal institutions of government that we have grown over a number of years. And as a result of it, it is not a country by country issue. It is an issue that we all need to work together on, government to government, militaries to militaries, all the organizations working together uh, to address this issue, because the traffickers will go where the least resistance is. And so, we, uh, as we've had success in Colombia, they've moved other places. And we, we have to start pressing on all sides uh, of the balloon. So, uh, that's why I'm as concerned uh, as I am, and that's why I focus as much on illicit trafficking as I do. Where did I put my... The other things uh, that we focus on, joint and combined training operations, we've talked about that. Uh, UNITAS has been in operations over 50 years now. It's a maritime uh, exercise uh, with the partner navies throughout the region. And it's been a long, enduring exercise and continues to get great support. Another example of the exercise we conduct, we'll conduct next month an exercise uh, with Panama, as well as our partners in the region, Panamax. Uh, a work to uh, help support Panama in the defense of the Panama Canal just because of the important <laughs> infrastructure it provides. And, and uh, we get support uh, from all uh, our military partners uh, throughout the region. We support peacekeeping operations. As you know, a lot of the militaries within the region are supporting peacekeeping operations throughout the world uh, to include MINUSTA, and I'll talk about that. That's an important relationship, and we work uh, to support that. And we have an exercise also that helps and then uh, disaster relief. 
This gives you an idea of what U.S. Southern Command has done within the last couple of years as far as different situations, different crises, uh, disasters that we have helped uh, support. Uh, we wait and we support uh, at the request of the governments that, that come in, but uh, that we go support. So this is not a unilateral, this is supporting international efforts uh, in this arena. Let me talk just a minute about Haiti. Uh, Haiti was a significant undertaking uh, for us with the United States Southern Command. We went from that standing start, if you will, of roughly about, I think we had 7,000 people assigned to United States Southern Command uh, on the 12th of January. And within two and a half weeks, uh, we had 19 ships. We had almost 22, or a little over 22,000 people uh, supporting uh, relief efforts. Uh, and about 7,000 of those just under were, uh, were on shore uh, in Haiti. Uh, we brought a lot of capacity. And from my standpoint, my focus was on a couple of different areas because there's a lot of support, a lot of supplies that come uh, with any disaster, especially one of the magnitude that happened in Haiti. So because the airport uh, and the, the tower at the airport had become non-functional, and it was the real lifeline we had for the three million people affected in, in Port-au-Prince. Uh, and the fact that the port had been uh, largely disabled, uh, we needed to have the ability to get goods across the shore. So we needed to make sure that the airport was operating and we had to have flexibility for the, whatever situation uh, we found. And that's what we looked uh, to support. So that's why the, we asked the aircraft carrier, Carl Vinson, I come down and it provided helicopter support that we didn't have to burden the airfield with the fuel, with the maintenance, with the activity uh, that happened uh, on the airfield. Uh, we asked for support from uh, marine amphibious groups um, and expeditionary groups because they have the capacity to move uh, goods from ships to shore. And I didn't know what other capacity we were going to have and they had the ability to do that, plus they had the flexibility to move wherever there was going to be uh, a problem. The hospital ship Comfort was not set to sail, and it responded in a record time and provided great uh, capacity as well. Uh, but a significant undertaking uh, for United States Southern Command. So what does that mean for me? Situational awareness. We did not un know what the situation on the ground was uh, in Haiti. So we made a lot of effort to coordinate and build capacities that we could gain that situational awareness. A lot of non-traditional means, if you will, for gathering that information. There's a lot of NGOs who work there. There's business people who work there. There's uh, church groups, so religious groups. Wherever we could find information was where we were looking to gain that awareness so that we could put the right capacity at the right place, all in coordination with the government of Haiti and the United Nations. Significant undertaking will be a significant undertaking no matter where we go. And so we're continuing to try and support that effort uh, with a SharePoint website that we're working with all our partner militaries uh, throughout the region to try and build the capacity that we can share information on a routine basis so that when a crisis happens, we already know how to share uh, information. Unity of effort. Uh, there were a lot of organizations associated with response uh, to Haiti, from a thousand different NGOs uh, to different organizations out of the UN, and so being able to pull all those pieces together, coordinate it, make sure we have a coordinated effort was significant. Our job was to support the lead federal agency from the United States, U.S. Agency for International Development. So uh, it, it is a significant effort and we can't take it for granted that we all know how to do it because we all have our own individual ways of supporting efforts and it's, it's, a, it's something that, that is very important in every instance in a crisis. Information sharing, I talked about that. Uh, there are some new capabilities uh, that are out there. In fact, Google uh, provided 25 Android handheld uh, devices. We gave those to our soldiers. And so our soldiers could go out to a location where there was a destroyed building or there was a, a blocked canal. There was an issue where we needed to understand what the situation was. They could take a picture. It would come back into uh, Google Earth geo-rectified, so we knew exactly the location, but it's instant awareness of what's going on on the ground. Those capacities, those capabilities are important in crisis to understand what's going on. We found 
uh, that there were hospitals that actually had capability. And we didn't know about that until we were able to get everybody up on a SharePoint and people start reporting uh, what their capacities were. So information sharing in a crisis is a critical requirement. I talk a logistics balance. And that is the normal tendency is to send whatever we think is the right thing and just flood the situation. Haiti, it was critical because we had a very, very small pipe. We had a single runway airport that could support 140 flights a day. That was the maximum. And we had a 10-day waiting list of flights to get in at, at the max of this. We weren't having any ships that were coming in. As you look to support from the Dominican Republic, it was a 12 to 16-hour drive uh, because of all the traffic. And yet we had ports that were clogged, we had, had airports were clogged because there wasn't an organization on the other end to take some of the goods that were delivered. So, so balancing the logistics demands in a crisis when there are uh, limited capacities is an important endeavor and it gets back to the information sharing that I talked about. And then we need to talk with everybody. We need to let everybody know what's going on, what the situations are, where we need help, what kind of help we need, just a, a continuous communication. Uh, because it helps everybody understand what assistance is there, what assistance is coming, when it will come. And so again, it's a, a dynamic situation uh, that requires that support uh, no matter what. And, and so uh, at a high level, those are the key things uh, that I took away uh, from our support uh, to Haiti. And we continue to work with uh, all the gov U.S. government agencies as well as the United Nations in supporting the continuing efforts uh, in Haiti. Right now, we, from a U.S. military, have gone back to traditional support to Haiti. Uh, and our traditional support means we support the Haitian uh, Coast Guard, because there is no military in Haiti, and so we don't support uh, non-military organization. Uh, and so we support the National Guard, but we have about 500 people in Gonaive right now doing what we call New Horizons. Uh, they're repairing schools, they're building schools, they're providing medical assistance, uh, a traditional exercise that we conduct not only in Haiti, uh, but throughout the region. And with that, uh, that's my view uh, of Latin America, the Caribbean. That's the focus uh, that I have is really on illicit trafficking because I see it as a very non-traditional uh, issue, but it's one that is as I talk with my counterparts throughout the region, is impacting almost every nation uh, in the region, non-traditional, and I think it's uh, the key issue uh, that we all need to continue uh, to work with in the region because it will undermine the potential for it, uh, undermining the capacity and capability within and stability in the region is, is something I'm not sure we always have our arms around. So with that, I'll be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you very much, General Fraser. Um, General has offered to uh, answer questions. Uh, if you could please um, raise your hand when you're, um, when you're called on. If you could please uh, state your name and your affiliation uh, before, your, uh, before you ask your question. Thank you very much. The floor is open for questions for General Fraser. Gentleman here, in the sure. the, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll bring a microphone to you, sir. Sir, George Nicholson, a policy consultant. You talked about capabilities. I was at the Surface Navy Association when the operation kicked off, and I asked the Marine Commandant, General Conway, who had just talked about the capability of the V-22 Osprey, able to fly un aerial refuel down there, put assessment teams in. I said, are they being used? And he paused and said, no, it would have been a great asset, but nobody asked for it. <laughs> are you all looking in the future with the capability of the V-22 Osprey being able to get in as rapidly, of taking assessment teams in, of doing an emergency medevac initially, of doing that kind of capability? From my standpoint, I haven't seen a resource that I didn't like. <laughs> so uh, in the response, actually, I, there's also a timing associated with this. So uh, the Marine Expeditionary Group that was available uh, was not an Osprey-equipped force. And so they're the ones who came down first. 
we asked a second one to come in, and actually they did have Ospreys uh, on board. And so they provided us with a lot of a capacity to range, especially the northern part of uh, Haiti. And, and that was important because we didn't have a good understanding of, of the situation uh, within the northern part of Haiti, uh, just from a communication standpoint. So their legs and, and their ability to move around uh, did uh, provide us with a lot of capability. So from my standpoint, uh, I wanted the flexibility and as much flexibility as, as we could provide from a military uh, force down there just because we didn't understand what the situation was and, and I wanted to be able to respond to whatever we found. Gentlemen here. And there. Uh, I'm Tom Schieber from National Institute for Public Policy. Uh, thanks for a nice concise overview of, of your mission, uh, General Fraser. I, I want to ask a question on how you think about Southcom's role in the counter WMD trafficking and smuggling issue. Uh, you painted a picture of the of the illicit trafficking and, and all of the the potential cargoes, uh, and you painted a picture of uh, a Hezbollah Hamas presence. Of course, we know uh, Iran has has also been been uh, active, increasingly so, in the area. And so the question is kind of how do you see Southcom's role? Uh, who are our partners to capability build with in, in the region and, and kind of where should we, uh, where do you see Southcom going in, in capacity building with partners in, uh, in the region for this, for this mission, which is related to illicit trafficking of other goods but is, is special in, in certain ways? Uh, from my standpoint, that's why I focus on illicit trafficking. Uh, because it does provide an avenue for the entry into the United States. Um, I have not seen any connection with it, but uh, I'm, I'm skeptical, and so I continue to look for uh, that connection. Again, I haven't seen that connection, but, but that's why I focus on it. And from my standpoint, um, I'm not sure right now that our operations would change significantly other than a focus point because of the significance of WMD uh, coming through that, those areas. But that's why we focus on reducing the overall illicit tra traffic and capacity. That's why I think it's important for all of us uh, because, um, because it does provide a capacity that we don't have as much visibility in as I would like. Uh, and so it continues to be uh, an area of, that, I, that I will watch. And, and as we get, if there are connections, then uh, we'll, we'll continue to address it at the time. But I don't see that right now. So bottom line to that answer is our focus on illicit trafficking helps us address the issue you're talking about. Uh, Julie McDonald, uh, Marstel Day, and thank you for your presentation. I noted that absent from uh, your conversation was environmental security concerns or climate change issues that are affecting the AOR, and I was wondering if you could elaborate on how those issues are shaping how you're thinking about not just natural disasters but other types of more long-term effects such as water management issues, water scarcity that will have a long-term impact, and how, are, how is that shaping how you engage countries in developing perhaps climate change adaptation strategies? From my standpoint, a lot of that falls to other parts uh, of the U.S. government. Uh, we would look at it from how it impacts security. And so we have an organization within Southern Command, in, uh, our J9, our partnering division, that works not only intergovernment and, and looks for those opportunities, but also works uh, private public to, to understand the concerns, the potential impacts, again, as they, they focus on a security standpoint uh, from my area. So it is an area that we're concerned about. Uh, we're focused somewhat on, but it's really uh, other parts of the U.S. government that we would support in their activities rather than us taking it on uh, by ourselves. And that is in, then in support of our partners wherever that becomes an issue. We have a question here at this table. Gentleman in the white shirt. 
Thank you. I think this is on. Ray Walser from the Heritage Foundation. Just to, uh, last week there was a security exercise at the Organization of American States in which one of your partner nations pointed its finger at another nation and said that there are illegal camps involved with illegal armaments uh, with FARC bases in Venezuela. Do you have a response or uh, a take on sort of the intel, which I presume is being shared, uh, that they presented last week? Well, we, uh, from a, a U.S. government standpoint, have had a long uh, concern about just the ability of the FARC and ELN, uh, as well as illicit traffickers, uh, to cross many borders. And so that's, that's the issue as I see it, and it's, and it's the, the ability of the organizations to do that. And so uh, I think it's an allegation that needs to be treated seriously, uh, and it's one that, uh, from a U.S. government standpoint, again, I, I think ought to be investigated, and investigated in a serious manner. Uh, Jessica Cruvant from Creative Associates, and thank you for calling me young. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask you to speak a little bit more about um, illicit trafficking in the area um, of Central America, and particularly about the gangs problem. So if you could elaborate a little bit about how you're dealing with that issue and a little bit more about your thoughts. A lot of the specific issues as, as we look at gang problems as, as well as uh, just the trafficking, it really falls in a law enforcement arena more than it does a military. But what we're seeing is El Salvador is an example, uh, Guatemala is, is becoming uh, an example of it also as well as Honduras where militaries are being asked to support law enforcement organizations to help address uh, the violence uh, in the region. So it is, from our standpoint, we support other U.S. government and other host uh, partner nation efforts to reduce that. So uh, we would provide some training, if requested, to militaries to help them understand uh, how to deal in a law enforcement situation and how to support uh, police organizations. So that's, that's really the connection uh, that we see with it. We also uh, support uh, partner navies. We have a program we call Enduring Friendship uh, where we're providing uh, some interceptor boats that they can now use to help interdict uh, the, um, the traffickers as they transit uh, close to shore because that's what we're finding. The, tra the traffickers are coming closer to shore, transiting through territorial waters, which makes international response uh, more difficult. We have a program of ship riders uh, also so that we have the capacity uh, from host nations to engage uh, in intercept requirements in, in territory waters if we have those agreements. So we, we look at, at on a holistic basis, if you will, but the specific issue with gangs and addressing them really is a law enforcement issue and it's better handled by other parts of our government. Richard White's Hudson Institute. How would you assess the uh, security and defense activities of some of the uh, extra hemispheric actors, particularly China, Russia, and Iran? I see from um, all of those nations, and, and there are others also, that there's a market uh, within South America, within Latin America, as, as they look to increase some of their military uh, capacity, not increase, but modernize some of their military uh, capacity. So I see that as an avenue. Uh, China I see primarily as interested in economics and resources. They are providing some uh, military capacity uh, to some of uh, the militaries there. Uh, Russia I see uh, focused on providing same kinds of capabilities. You just saw, uh, I saw a report this morning uh, that they will provide some helicopters to Peru. Uh, so they're looking for markets um, around the region also. So that's, that's where I see, uh, especially from a Russia 
in a China engagement. I also see the countries, though, throughout Latin America, well, throughout the Western Hemisphere, that includes U.S., Canada, we're also, especially as you look at China, looking at China as a place for markets uh, also. So I see that activity just as, as the normal interaction of international uh, commerce. Uh, from an Iranian uh, standpoint, uh, they are increasing uh, their presence uh, in the number of embassies uh, that they have uh, within uh, the region. Uh, on a, a number of levels. Uh, they've gone from seven. I think they'll open their 12th embassy uh, in the region this year. My concern there is just their traditional support to Hamas and Hezbollah uh, and whether or not that then uh, has an impact in Latin America, the Caribbean. I have not seen that connection uh, right now, so I see primarily diplomatic and commercial activity. Uh, I don't see anything beyond that. Ben Birnbaum, Washington Times. Um, I want to follow up on the gentleman's question about the Venezuela-Colombia tensions. The Venezuelan ambassador said a couple days ago that his country was on red alert, and I was wondering if you had seen any indications of that, and if you thought that there was a chance of a flare-up in the near future. I, I've seen two different parts of that. I've seen that there was activity, but then I've also seen reports uh, that there isn't uh, activity. What I would ask is that Colombia and Venezuela uh, address this in a diplomatic uh, arena, and I think uh, that's, that's the activity that I've seen. There's been um, activity within the OAS, as we mentioned, and I think there's a meeting today with UNASUR uh, in which that will be discussed. That's the proper forum uh, for addressing uh, the issue. Pedro Urelli from BNB Consulting. General, uh, Plan Colombia just celebrated its 10th year, and it's a concerted effort at $6 billion expenditure to support the institutions of Colombia to get a hold of a number of issues that we're dealing with. I mean, actually, it changed in objectives, and many people have called it a success. But you, among others, by showing certain slides, have admitted that some of the problems that you were dealing with have actually just shifted to the country next door, mm -hmm. Venezuela. From a Western Hemisphere perspective, not just from a pure U.S. Colombia perspective, would you say that Plan Colombia therefore has been a success or a failure? I will, I will say we've got kind of a mixed bag there is my assessment. Plan Colombia as it was designed and as it has been supported has been and is a success, but it's not over yet. The FARC is still active uh, within Colombia. The list of traffickers are still active. It still is a difficult country from a geographic standpoint uh, to address. Uh, the Colombians have matured beyond uh, Plan Colombia. If you look at Plan Consolidacion uh, and the efforts that they're focused there, and that's starting to make some uh, differences also as you look at how they've gone out across the country. So. Uh, I think what we are coming to, at least from my perspective, is a recognition that that success has bred now problems in other parts. And that's why we need to look at it as a regional issue. And I would argue that we all need to work together to build a plan, Latin America, to address this from a regional standpoint, recognizing that the traffickers will go to where they find the best opportunity to operate, and that's going to be traditional, and it's not going to be, it will be a long-term effort, uh, as we've seen within Colombia, but I think it's, it's worth uh, continuing the efforts in Colombia, and as we look, at least from a U.S. standpoint, uh, there's a program as we focus to support to Mexico, Merida, uh, there's a Central American Region Security Initiative that looks to support Central American countries, there's a Caribbean Nation Security Initiative, or Caribbean uh, Initiative, so looking to provide similar capacities as Plan Colombia, if you will, in other parts so that we don't have the result uh, that we had in, uh, with the success in Colombia. So I think it's an evolution is what I see. Gentleman here, please. Uh, 
Norman Bailey, Institute of World Politics. Um, thank you for your presentation. Much of the cocaine that goes to West Africa and from West Africa up to Europe uh, goes out uh, through the mouth of the Orinoco. And my question is whether aerial and maritime surveillance of the mouth of the Orinoco has been increased. We're looking as, as we look to the eastern part because there is uh, more capacity going there. We're, we're trying to get our arms around all exactly where the trafficking is coming out. Whether it is the Orinoco, there's a lot that is also transiting out, if you will, through Argentina as well uh, as Brazil. Those are growing uh, problems also. So uh, we're working with our partners uh, in each of those regions uh, to do that. I've asked for a capacity uh, to increase at least our over-the-horizon capability in the eastern part uh, of the Caribbean. We're looking to understand what that really means. Uh, and so from both an intel-derived, law enforcement-derived, as well as a surveillance capacity, we are looking in that area. Uh, but we have, um, we have not increased the number of forces, if you will, uh, overall that are focused there because the bigger trafficking route remains Central America. Bruce Graham, Textron. Good morning, sir, and thank Good you. Uh, you started to address the shift of some of your surveillance uh, operations. You talked about Merida after Plan Columbia. There was another plan called RAMP. Can you tell me what the status of it is? I understand there's been some funding issues, and where do you see that going? RAMP, uh, just so everybody knows, is a program the U.S. Uh, Air Force, Air Forces South, has advocated for a number of years uh, to provide some um, capacity of our partner nations within, especially Central America, to provide awareness of what trafficking is uh, within the region. Uh, right now, it hasn't changed. It, it, it still is not receiving uh, support. Uh, but as we look at the overall situation, we are looking to build uh, and review, as we look at Merida, Carsey, all these programs on what makes sense uh, within, within the region. Um, and we're going to have to focus dollars where they make the most sense. Right now, the maritime environment, the ground environment, has a much bigger transit of drugs than does the air environment. Uh, and we are having some success just by being able to respond to air tracks that are coming into the region and being able to understand where they are in reducing some of that capacity. So it's something that we're looking at. Uh, we need to understand how to do that. Our partners in the region would like uh, some of that capacity, uh, so uh, it's, a, it's an effort that still is underway and we're still addressing. We have time for one more question, the, the gentleman in the back, please. Yes. Hi, I'm Luis Alonso with the AP, and I will have a follow-up question on the Colombia-Venezuela issue. I would like to ask you, General, whether South Command has assessed, reviewed this evidence that the Colombian government says is new and has been collected in the last two, three weeks. Is this reliable? Is this true? Is the coordinates that the Colombian government is giving out, is it, has South Command uh, checked that out? Thank you. From my standpoint, uh, I'm looking at the information uh, that the government of Colombia has provided. I have no reason to un to uh, to assume that it, that it is uh, not valid. We're looking at it. Uh, but it is really, I think, important uh, that uh, Venezuela in investigate uh, the allegations uh, and do a, a very concerted effort because that will help uh, validate uh, the data if it is. Uh, well, it'll help validate the data. Okay. General Fraser, thank you so much for your excellent presentation, uh, for your generosity in, in uh, answering so many questions, and for, for being here today with us. Thank you. It's a great pleasure. Thank you very much.